So hi folks. Um, today uh, I'm gonna I kind of jotted down a few little notes, but I'm mostly kind of going off the cuff with this. Um, I certainly have enough feelings to fill up an hour at least, but I won't trust me. I won't bore you with an hour's worth of video. Um, I want to discuss the progression of music from then, meaning say the um, turn of the 20th century, the uh, early 1900s on up till now, the digital age, and the progression of things that occurred, uh, uh, musically speaking, and why perhaps, this is my speculation on why the music today, uh, that's at least, well, the popular music today is a little bit to me on the insipid side and barely listenable. Uh, being a trained musician, it literally hurts my ears and makes my nervous system jump when I hear a lot of this, uh, the contem contemporary hip hop and EDM that's coming out. Uh, to me, it's a total nightmare and cannot be good for the psyche whatsoever. Call me old fashioned. Um, all right. So first you have to look at postmodernism and that's a, that's kind of a tricky term. I mean, um, the way I see it is that certain trends uh, kind of follow a postmodern path, but those trends could start at different times. For example, if you look at the classical music, okay, uh, you could go prior to the 1900s when there was a, a postmodern, uh, um, how do you say, like an escalation of the postmodern aesthetic or idea or um, way of thinking almost. Okay, so let's examine that first. If you look at um, classical music, it proceeded according to some basic laws of, well, not basic, but laws of music that were laid down hundreds of years before. And when you look at, you know, you compare Bach to Mozart, yes, Mozart's music is a little more subjective, a little more personal. Bach's is more objective and spiritual, that sort of thing. But nonetheless, I mean, uh, the laws of harmony all the way through were being followed. A dominant seventh chord will resolve to a one chord um, normally. All right. Then what happened, what, what seems to happen is things progress, things progress, things progress. Then the creative people start to get bored and they say, OK, well, why don't we question these laws and, and why don't we change things up? Who says these are the laws of music? Who says to the point where it got so absurd because they were eventually discussing, is there even such thing as dissonance? Well, if it sounds like shit, yeah, there's such thing as dissonance. I'm sorry. Now, dissonance can be interpreted in a variety of ways by different people. No accounting for taste. Certainly when I talk about the minor ninth interval, some people seem to like it. I think it's just but ugly, but that's just me. Uh, and I will be uh, talking about the minor ninth interval again on, on my uh, fragment series. Um, so anyway, the composers get bored. They start to say, okay, they question the rules. So then you get people like the, uh, the romantics were still following the rules, but they stretched them as far as they could possibly stretch them. So finally there had to be a breaking point, And that breaking point was with the impressionists who began using exotic scales, uh, unresolved dominant chords, this sort of thing. Like, uh, there's a piece by Ravel called, um, uh, Pavan for a Dead Princess, a really depressing title, but it's a haunting work. And he does a series of ninth chords progressing downward that simply don't resolve. They're just there for the sound of it. And there's nothing bad about that, you know. However, strangely enough, Impressionism uh, didn't last very long whatsoever until all of a sudden people started getting into modernism. And modernism meant there's no such thing as this, and it's we're going to make a mess of noise. And this is where you get um, composers like uh, Arnold Schoenberg, who created a totally dissonant system. A system it is, but it's totally dissonant. And, um, and uh, Igor Stravinsky, who, got, who came up with a new concept of uh, dissonance and consonance. Basically, rather than a chord being dissonance and then it resolving to, to consonance, he decided that you can have an entire section of music 32, 64, 428 bars of music that's utterly dissonant. And then you resolve those 128 bars with something very consonant and harmonious. That was one of his concepts. I liked the way he thought he had some interesting stuff going on. 
All right. So um, what you get eventually with this uh, progression, if that's what you want to call it, is when you reach the very top, you get chaos. And what happens when you reach that chaos period is that it starts to fall back on itself. Okay. And then it starts to settle down. And then all of a sudden, we start resorting to more traditional techniques of harmony again. They come back, they come back. Because let's face it, dissonance is not something everybody could live with on a daily basis. It, it's nice for a trend, I guess, but uh, you know, as, par, as far as a popular music goes, that ain't gonna fly. Okay, so the image I have, uh, which I'm borrowing from someone else, but it's a brilliant idea, is that postmodernism works like a fountain. Okay, the water is going up, 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 and then it reaches the chaos point. And the chaos point would be, according to the laws of natural physics, Newtonian physics, the water can go only so high, depending on its pressure, and eventually it starts to fall back on itself. So this is the original water coming up, and when it falls back on itself, it sees its own reflection in the stream coming up. And uh, what it does is it... it takes elements of that reflection and puts them together. That's exactly what postmodernism is. Postmodernism is everything has been done. So now we have to look at everything that's been done and we're going to pastiche all this old stuff together into something that might seem new. Um, we're not, this is a very critical period in human history in terms of the arts and, and whatever else, actually, uh, as far as I see it. Uh, this has never happened before in history where all of a sudden all the laws get broken and now we're picking up the pieces going the way i saw it was like the modernism is like a big party and then postmodernism is like the day after the party you've got to clean up your house and it's a complete mess um so this this progression from orderliness 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 to chaos and then the chaos falls back down and then you get you picking up the pieces and remending them together and getting new, somewhat new, uh, you know, forms out of that, right? So this happens very specifically in music. It happened in classical, it happened in jazz, and it happened in rock and roll. Okay. Um, uh, example in jazz would be, um, oh God, I forget the name of the dude, but. Uh, it, jazz got to a point where they're following the laws, following the laws, and then they went into free, what was called free jazz, which was just play whatever the hell. In classical music, the terminology was aleatory music, music of chance, chance music. And uh, they were doing that in the classical days way before the jazzers, where they would just, uh, you know, point to a section of the orchestra and they'd play whatever they wanted. And then you'd get whatever noise that was generated from that. Um I can't think of the jazz composer. He, he wrote a book called Harmelotics, which a friend of mine gave me. It makes no sense to me whatsoever. I, I think it's just a bunch of BS, quite honestly. Uh, but basically, jazz went into this dissonant period, uh, and then it began to fall back on itself. And now what we hear in jazz today are the more traditional ways of dealing with it. So um, that. In rock and roll, um, you can say that the height of uh, the chaos in rock and roll, you can see how these are happening in different periods of time. So postmodernism kind of latches on to a particular movement or tradition, pushes it to its extent. But this can happen at different periods. That's why I don't, I don't really see like an overall period called postmodernism. It, it seems to affect different areas at different times. But uh, in any case, in rock and roll, I would say around 1969, 1970 is when rock and roll uh, and the social movement connected with rock and roll reaches point of utter chaos. If you go back to like 1965, 66, the hippies were, they call themselves the beautiful people and they literally were. I mean, their fashions were gorgeous and, you know, they looked really cool. All their fashions came from Carnaby Street in London. But then by 69, it got into the caveman look and everybody went into this kind of savagery mode and you get like a chaotic uh, rock concert like Woodstock. Uh, that's where the fountain falls back on itself. What you see in the 70s is that fountain having fallen back. Now they're re-piecing music together. But uh, say, for example, in the case of the Beatles, uh, when you get to the White Album, there's the, the um, song Revolution Number no. 9, which, of course, is just a, 
a bunch of noises thrown together for how many minutes. Uh, and also uh, a kind of uh, it doesn't matter attitude uh, you could find on that white album by the Beatles, uh, you know, like they're just kind of tossing nonsense out there. Um, that to me is a sign of postmodernism uh, having hit the Beatles. And what happened after the White Album, they did Let It Be. They wanted to get back to rock and roll. That didn't quite work. I mean, the whole concept behind Let It Be was, hey, we started out as a performing band. Let's get back into being a performing band. Let's do a movie based on us rehearsing for the show, and then we'll do a live performance. Didn't quite turn out. The Beatles plans never really turned out the way they wanted them to. Um, uh, it just things kind of changed. Like, for example, Sgt. Pepper was supposed to be a concept album. It was supposed to be this idea of Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band was uh, a, the record was sp supposed to be portraying this band and inviting people up to the stage to join them and that sort of thing. But after a while, the concept just fell apart and they created the record. Um, but uh, yeah, so you can see it in rock and roll. You can see it in jazz. You can see it in classical music. The fountain falling back on itself. All right. Now, one thing uh, about American music is that it's so it was so different than the European traditions in so many ways. And uh, when you go back to Europe, the tradition uh, was academic. You, if you wanted to be a, a composer, you better go to school and learn how to orchestrate, and learn music theory, and blah 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 blah. Um, but then, when the blues began to happen in America. These were, quotes, self-educated musicians, which doesn't mean a lot. They didn't understand uh, what they were doing exactly. And, and actually, the naivete that the blues brought about, uh, th that the blues was created from, uh, th they just by serendipity happened on a law of music that no one ever discovered before. And that is minor under major, which was never, ever done in the past. But the whole idea is a self-educated musician brought up from the roots of America. By the time you have the Brits living, uh, listening to American music, that was their ticket to freedom because they're thinking, well, I don't have to go to school. I can pick up a guitar and play. And uh, so uh, America brought forth this idea of the uneducated musician. However, when you see the progression from the uneducated music, it begins to um, scale up and up and up. What happens is you take maybe someone like Robert Johnson and then uh, usually it's the white folks that did the, the uh, kind of tweakery and stuff like this, but, uh, well, not always, but uh, in any case, they listening to some Robert Johnson going, oh, that's cool, and he has great technique. I want to emulate that te technique and get better than him, all right? And so people, by virtue of absorbing the style, would, would uh, do their best to, uh, to improve upon what they'd seen before. And so it built up and so it built up the blues and gospel together as a kind of yin yang force in American music um, uh, produced finally the first child of the blues was jazz. And uh, uh, then you could say jazz blues gospel branched out into ragtime, Dixieland, uh, you know, that kind of stuff from the 1920s. Uh, what do they call that stuff? I forget now. Uh, but, you know, the various, like, offshoots of improvised music. That's the second thing that is Amer wholly American, uh, is improvised music. Now, don't get me wrong. There is improvisation in traditional Indian music uh, and other forms in the Middle East. But as far as the West goes... This was the first sign of uh, free improvisation based on the laws of music. Uh, so th that eventually progressed into the form we call jazz. When jazz became untenable, uh, in other words, the technique got better and better and better until you got to the bebop period. Um, guys that wanted to play were like, well, Jesus, I don't want to like have to match this incredible level that these people played at, but I want to play. Uh, so what happened was um, the blues brought forth a more popular form in the sense of a people accessible to people kind of musicians, uh, accessible to uneducated musicians, a form of music called rock and roll. And um, the same process went on with that. I mean, uh, 
the Beatles were listening to Elvis Presley and uh, Little uh, Little Richard and uh, Chuck Berry. Chuck Berry, um, you know, it may sound like really raw guitar playing that he's doing, but his technique was. I had to teach the introduction to uh, Johnny Be Good, and I, uh, you know, when I figured out what he was doing, it's like, wow, this was actually pretty intense. This isn't just for kids. You know, you got to learn how to do this. So the Beatles noticed this sort of thing, and they, again, with their attitude of we want to do better than our heroes, began to refine and refine it. Uh, so we have the uneducated musicians, the Beatles, for example, from the street, street kids, refining and refining and refining. And then you get to a form that is actually enviable and admirable and sets the standard really high. Uh, so you can see this happening over and over again in the, uh, the history of American music. So why is it different today? Okay. Well, first of all, I want to discuss an idea that I've thought of for quite some time. The idea that limitation, having limitation is important to creativity. When you have no struggle, you have no uh, motivation to do better than, to reach for, to go higher than. So, in other words, if this process keeps happening over and over again, and now rock and roll is dead, I get that. Rock and roll is, is a bygone form, and now what we have left as popular music forms are EDM and uh, hip hop. Now, I shouldn't have a problem with EDM and hip hop, but I do. I have an immense problem with it. So what is the difference? It's the same thing, right? They're they're gonna they're starting with a rudimentary form. They're gonna improve on it, improve on it, improve on it. The difference here is that in the digital world, you are virtually unlimited. Now these two words are really important: the idea of virtually and the idea of unlimited. Um, when you have a limitation, well, uh, I'm going to tell the story I told before, and actually the way I told it was a bit of an exaggeration, but the Beatles, John and Paul, when they were first learning to play guitars, had to travel 10 miles to learn a B7 chord. Now, because of the effort they had to make to get that chord, do you think they're going to cherish it and use that chord as much as they, you know, as much as they can employ that chord? I mean, I, I went through all the trouble to get this chord. I'm going to freaking use it, right? So there is an idea that, that the limitations they have showed them the value of what they reached for and made effort to achieve, okay? So limitation fosters creativity. So with the advent of the digital world, what you have is unlimited. You want um, a 40-piece orchestra? It's on your computer. Uh, any, you want virtual instruments that don't even exist? It's on your computer, right? Um, do you want to do the weirdest time signatures ever without ever having to play an instrument and learn, figure out how to do it? It's on your computer, okay? There is no limitation. The example I can give you is um, uh, the new um, Androids they're coming out with. And when I say Android, I don't mean the phone. I mean fake people that are AI-driven. And uh, supposedly now they're selling sex bots, people, I mean, things that look like people that people can have sex with. Now, this is a great example of, one, instant gratification, all right, this desire to not have to work for something and get it, and the idea of virtuality that this isn't going to be really fulfilling sex you have with the, this, you know, fake human being. There's no emotional connection. There's no spiritual connection. It's just getting off. So there's a kind of emptiness to it. So when you consider the digital world, that's the problem. Everything is virtual. It's not real. And secondly, you don't have to go beyond typing a few keys on your keyboard and clicking a mouse and you get what you want. When you get what you want, there is simply no inspiration. It's as if you're a spoiled child and you expect everything to have, you know, to come to your, fall into your lap. And that's, I guess, you know, why some people complain about the millennials uh, being lazy. I forget what the complaint was about millennials. I don't particularly care. It's just that uh, we have to, you know, it's strange. We have to get back to a sense of limitation. Now, the ironic part of it is the limitation is glaring, 
before the eyes of all these contemporary composers that write on a computer. And that is the fact that they cannot play an instrument to save their lives. They don't know music theory to save their lives. Um, so that's their limitation. But the problem is instant gratification, all right? No desire to work. Why should I bother learning to play a guitar when I can have a virtual guitar on my computer? Why should I go to music school when I could go to YouTube? All right. Instant gratification, no work, no effort. And this is the most, this is the biggest problem with contemporary music we have today is that the digital world has pretty much destroyed everything. And, uh, yeah, I mean, when you look at, say, for example, apps, right? Everything is about instant gratification. I don't want to have to shop. So I, I get my shopping app and, you know, I could get groceries. I could get whatever delivered to my door. Never have to leave my computer. Okay. So what we had then back in the old days before the digital revolution we had a sense of limitation and the idea of struggling and striving for. Today in the digital, after the post-digital revolution world, uh, we don't have such thing as that limitation and therefore the tendency is to be lazy and to go for that instant gratification, wish fulfillment, instant wish fulfillment like the uh, sex bot, okay? So um, I think we're, the composers, the contemporary composers, and when I speak of composers right now, I'm not talking about the uh, the, the guys who write cinematic music and all this stuff, because they know what they're doing. They, they understand limitation and they know how to reach for something higher harmonically or something beyond harmonically. Um, I'm talking about popular music. In fact, this really whole lecture is about pop music. And uh, I'm a pop music guy. I, was, I may be a nerd, but I love popular music, you know. And uh, as I've always said, I, I, yes, I hate, I fucking hate contemporary pop music. Yes, I do. It's awful. It hurts my ears. It makes my nervous system just crazy. But I will say this. If any of these young composers came up with something good, I would get so excited about it. I'd be their freaking cheerleading section. I honestly would. I love good music. I really do. I've always loved good music. Throughout my lifetime, when somebody came up, you know, yeah, I'm a Beatles worshiper, but when the, the police came onto the scene, uh, meaning Sting and the police, uh, they kind of created this new paradigm, and it was truly creative and truly unusual and interesting, and I once again got passionate in those days about that music. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm open-minded and closed-minded at the same time, a close minded in the same in the sense that I'm willing to in one fell swoop say all contemporary popular music sucks. Now, another thing you have to consider is um, when jazz began to raise the bar and get more and more sophisticated, popular music composers, all right, back in the 40s, the 30s, the 20s, the popular music composers were well trained musicians. They, they literally did go to school. Uh, to learn how to write music on paper, learn how to orchestrate for band. This is where you get the big band music in the 40s. Uh, all this stuff that, you know, there's an education factor. And nowadays, if you get a young person who's interested in music, they're not going to say, Mom, Dad, would you send me to music school? They're going to, like, just go to YouTube and uh, try to sort things out from there. Not that YouTube isn't helpful. I mean, I had a guitar student. Uh, he was pretty good. He'd been, like you know, learn guitar off of YouTube for two years. And then he realized, wow, I need the interaction of another human being to fill in the gaps. And he came to me, um, you know. So in any case, yes, I'm closed minded in the sense that, yes, I can say in one under one umbrella, all contemporary pop music sucks eggs. OK, on the same token, I'm open minded in the sense that I'm willing to say that my ears are open for really good music and I can't wait to hear it. I can't wait to hear it because, you know, music has a tremendous power to unite people together. Uh, I grew up in the 60s, so I know what I'm talking about. I saw it happen. And that's one reason why, you know, you can consider the conspiracy theory. Um, it's either conspiracy theory or just out and out greed. And basically all the dirty stuff you've seen going on in this world 
is is either greed or conspiracy, literal conspiracy. But uh, the conspiracy that um, uh, that mo contemporary music is is made is purposely made badly to keep people dumbed down, and and keep them disunited, not to unify. Uh, when you have popular music, and this is what you know, social justice warriors just really. There's such a thorn in my side. They're they're complaining about sexism, right? And and yet, they're listening to music that that talks about women as being hoes and bitches. They're listening to music that glorifies empty capitalism, bling, getting all the shit you can to make yourself look shiny. I mean, the hypocrisy is so overwhelming. And the reason why the hypocrisy exists is because these people know they're really not truly social justice warriors. They're looking in way the wrong direction. There's an old Zen saying uh, about uh, the master pointing to the moon and the student looking at the hand instead of looking at the moon. And with that, I will bid you a good day. I hope you enjoyed this little rant of mine. And uh, yeah, I have a few ideas for other videos, uh, uh, especially with the Beatles. I'm, I'm thinking of doing a uh, two different Beatles things. One is a number of Beatles first, because the younger people today don't realize um, what's happened in music up until today, popular music from since the 60s, is uh, the Beatles created these firsts that never happened before, and now they're used offhandedly today, and were actually since the 70s. So uh, I want to do a collection of firsts that the Beatles did. First time it was ever done in popular music. Another thing I want to do is a little bit on Beatles endings to songs because their endings are spectacular. They really are. Uh, so many endings to Beatles songs are exciting and surprising. So that's another thing I'm going to do. Another one I want to do is to kind of boil down my fragments of infinity, especially level two, to just do a, a, a video on one concept, just one concept alone not going further than that so I can clarify that and make it easier to understand and assimilate. And that'll be it for today. Happy New Year, you guys, and uh, talk to you soon.